Yeah, uh, so I'm Jordan Shallow. I'm a chiropractor, strength and conditioning coach, a competitive powerlifter, podcaster person, live on the internet now. Um, I went to chiropractic college in California, was a chiropractor at Apple's world headquarters in Cupertino, um, transitioned into the strength and conditioning coach role for the rugby team at Stanford University. I uh, own two practices in the Bay Area. I started a fitness company uh, centered around the education space about two years ago. And for the last 18 months, 20 months, I've been on the road teaching applied biomechanics, injury risk management, sports performance, just sort of all over. So packed up in San Francisco. One more time, those last three. Uh, what did I say? Body mechanics. Uh, biomechan- applied biomechanics, injury risk management, sports performance. That's kind of. I just want them to really hear that. Yeah, that's the jam. Yeah. So that's that's been it. Every every weekend, a different city for the past yeah about two years. Hit the road, August August what it would have been twenty eighteen, and just been traveling around ever since. So I've known I've known for you, I've known of you for a, a little while now, but uh, I've known in person now a couple of days here. And the one thing I can tell, and I've always been somewhat been able to tell, is that you're a continuous learner. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this you study I have to. Yeah. Because I, I think now, like with the access to information, it's like, yeah, there's bad information. But really, there's a lot of people on the cutting edge that are pushing the baseline. Like, I'm sure you've seen since you've like started in this, it's like however many years ago that like the base knowledge of of like your standard gym goer has risen. Right, so if you're going to be an educator in the space, you need to be continuously upping your game because the availability to better information, albeit harder to find, is there. So to be on the leading edge, you really need to be a forever student in this stuff. I agree with you. I, I, and no, I appreciate that because I, I know that a lot of old timers um, get stuck in their way um, for me. I, I got the benefit of being the old timer, but also being with the, the nice new social media and influence now um, and, and see both sides of the world. But uh, uh, it's you continue to learn and learn and learn. And I'm excited about your future just because you're a pup right now. You're 29, if I'm correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I cannot imagine the, the extreme knowledge you're going to have in another 10, 15, 20 years of just continuously doing this. Yeah, I, mean, I think the biggest thing is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, right? Like that Dunning-Kruger yeah. effect. Yeah. So it's for me, it's I'm less and less sure, but like on the research end, you become less and less sure because you read more. But you, as we talked about the other day, you become more confident on the experience end because you've done this and you've seen so many cases and you've seen yeah. so many things that you start to shy, not shy away from, but you get to, you can gain a better perspective of the pillars of evidence like a lot of people think research is evidence and in my field like research is a big driver but like there are no squirrels in this room right now we we're not going to say that squirrels don't exist but and that's where people they just go the the research route that's the 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 single lens they can look through and then that myopic approach and they don't have any experience of themselves or training clients they they become so certain in the one lens that they look through because they're blind to their, you know, they don't know what they don't know, and that's often in the experience end. So as you kind of transition, you're like, okay, I really don't know much because you realize how much there is to know. But on the flip side of that, you end up with so much experience that you can start to categorize those experiences and be like, oh, okay, I've seen this before, I've seen this before. Yeah, now we have a lot of uh, mutual friends, Ben Pikulski, um, who's a great guy. And again, someone that continuously studies. Um, and, and very knowledgeable, but uh, continuously driving to learn more and more and more, uh, which, I, which I love too, is here's the one big thing you were just kind of talking about. I want to see if we can help these guys out, all these guys that are watching this uh, today. And you said something about research, and they get locked in on the research idea. If it, if it says this in this magazine, that's it. There's no, there's no way around it. What can you kind of tell these guys about research relative to taking that research, applying it? I, I, I'm an old school Bruce Lee kind of guy. Um, you know, martial arts was around for thousands of years. And then you have this one individual that was a kid at the time comes in and goes, oh, no, 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 this is all wrong. Let me show you a, a different approach. And then he, he combines everything and makes MMA. Bef- and, and it's been, again, thousands of years. So how did this one individual come in and say, no, the whole history is wrong, in a sense. Let me show you a different style. How can you tell these guys that read this article 
um, squatting is bad for your body. Yeah. Okay, now I just read it. No, no, that's true then. Because I read it in a magazine, it has to be true that squatting is bad. So I'm going to skip that. When squatting is like, for me, there's things that have kept me together. And squats is one of the exercises that have kept me healthy for my career. So how can you talk to these guys and tell them how to, is there any kind of tricks that you come up with? Well, yeah, it's about interpretation, right? Like you don't want to just read research. Like I'll make a less than politically correct example to the Bible. And depending, well, depending on where I'm presenting, I will or will not make this comparison. But like you can read the Bible and I think whether religious or not, like there's archetypal stories in there that you can interpret and derive some benefit, regardless of your, you know, faith or denomination or whatever. And I think a lot of people who get a little too preachy on the research side or similar to people who might get a little too preachy on the religious side that becomes their doctrine but there's interpretations like if you think someone lived in a whale and then you know that's like okay that's a disney movie but that <laughs> but you can interpret a benefit from that story right like jonah and the whale you can interpret that he was or, in a bad position in a bad place and so yeah and that's like you know adam and eve like there's there's deeper meanings to be found if you want to look for it it's the same thing with research right like a lot of people they they just read research and i like there's a story in the Old Testament, Old Testament God, if you've ever, and like, I'm not super religious or anything. I just, I'm just interested. So I, I've read the Bible a few times. And like, how is Heath Evans not here today? Man, <laughs> we keep going, keep yeah, going. No, no, no. Like, there's, there's, a, there's like a story in like the Old Testament about like a bald guy who gets insulted by a bunch of kids and God sends two bears down to like kill 43 children. It's like, okay, maybe that didn't happen. Um, but maybe there's, that doesn't mean throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like there's a lot of meaning to be derived and interpreted from the Bible, again, regardless of denomination, just like there's a lot of value in interpretation of research, but it has to be interpretation. There has to be a, a synthesization of what we'll deem to be facts. Like I know the article you're talking about, the squats are bad for your knees. It was published in 1961 in the journal of American physical Thera manual Thera therapeutics by a guy named Carl Klein. Right. I've read it and I've read it in magazines over and over and over again. But if you actually take the time to download and find the full text from 61 and you read it, you can start to see confirmation biases laden within like within the actual research itself. Like they were measuring valgus and various forces. It means someone was just pushing on people's knees after they squatted and then they drove a false equivalency. More laxity through valgus and varus is bad for your knees. Like says who? Says who? You're testing post competition Olympic weightlifting. There's so much to the mechanics behind it. Like, and I think when we were training yesterday, it's like if you can understand the anatomy, you can understand the basic principles, then you can start to, to extrapolate and, and interpret research better. Like people, if that's the only thing they have, then they have to cling to it. Where it's like if you know, like, okay, there, you know, there's research about like hip thrusting versus front squats or hip thrusting versus squats for sprint speed. This is one that I'll use as a case study for my students. Like read this article and tell me what's wrong with it. Like, well, the hip thrust moves the pelvis from posterior to anterior, and that's where a pelvis moves when we're sprinting, right? Show me a sprinter with a small ass. You, you, you can't, can't do it, right? You can't exactly. do it. I'll show you, oh, you'll show me a very slow runner is what you'll show me. So it's like that's, that's plain specificity. Now, in this research article, they use a front squat as, a, as an intervention. It's like, well, the front squat, if we front squat properly, there's likely minimal. Like if you throw your hips way back in a front squat, and if you've ever front squatted before, then you'll know that that's a really disadvantageous position to be in. Like that's, you're not gonna, the bar's just gonna roll off your shoulders. The whole point is to keep your pelvis underneath you and load your quads. So it's like, I give this to students, like tell me what's wrong with this. Now I have to find a new research study because they're gonna listen to this and know. Comparing two completely but like, different things. Yeah, right? it's yeah. not even apples and oranges, it's apples to fish, yeah. right? And that's, <laughs> but someone who wrote that may have had a confirmation bias to prove that the hip thrust was beneficial against sprint speed. It's like, well, because if you know the plane specificity of the movement, you can pick another movement that's going to be totally irrelevant, and then you can prove that this one is superlative to this one. So it's like if you know the basic biomechanics, then the interpretation of the research becomes easy. Something I always try to talk about is, is just common sense. Magazines or, or, or websites or anything that's putting out information has to continue to put out information or it's not going to survive. It's a magazine. And so... I've always talked about that, like the eat grass and grow diet. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, eat grass and grow. It's a new thing. I couldn't make up anything else, couldn't come up with anything, so I wrote something. That's the whole concept behind magazines is they're going to take something, change it a little bit, and try to come up with something. And a lot of the information that's out there gets diluted or, or 
misled in a way. Um, and, and you use the Bible, and I always use like the, the law. You know, the law is an interpretation, and that's why nobody wants to go to court. Uh, they want to settle because it's the same sentence for both sides, and they can argue it two different ways. And with exercising, it seems like there's so much argument about what's right and wrong when we're all just trying to do the same thing is get better. Right. And so with that being said, um, coming into this and teaching these guys, everybody out here that's watching, the difference between what a compound movement is supposed to do relative to a secondary exercise. Um, like yesterday, we did, take an example, we did uh, some uh, bench press and some incline presses, and then we went over to some dumbbells, and then we finished off with some flies. Why so, and why in that order? Yeah, so the contrast, like the, the bodybuilder versus like the power lifter would probably be a good way to start in contrasting training muscles and training movements, right? Compound versus isolation, or compound versus accessory. Like for me as a power lifter, my technique work is training muscles in isolation. Like I'm constantly practicing the skill of squat bench and deadlift, but when my squat bench and deadlift break down now as an advanced lifter, it's gonna be because of weak triceps in a bench press or weak delts in a bench press or weak pecs in a bench press. Whereas an early adopter to a training a movement, it might just be a lack of coordination within the movement itself. So defining, breaking apart like who's performing which one of these movements. Like you have a novice powerlifter, a novice bodybuilder, an no, uh, advanced powerlifter and an advanced bodybuilder. Like, Failure for all four of these categories is going to be different, right? For novice, it's usually going to be technical error. Like, you can't really grow your biceps until you understand that there's a skill to a bicep grow, just as there's a skill to a bench press, just as there's a skill to a squat, and there's a skill to a quad extension, right? So once we've kind of broken up, okay, who it is we're talking to, we can start to address what the benefit of training compound versus training isolation would be. And I think a lot of people, again, they get dogmatic, right? Where bodybuilders just going to do isolation stuff. Right, like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to squat. It's bad for my back. It's like, well, you know, we, we're meant to do that, and like, good performance and good aesthetics often go hand in hand. Like, some of the best looking bodybuilders I know are also the most functional bodybuilders. It's a guy who have you know, the disproportions are often a representation of uh, of asymmetries in performance. Right, like disproportionately, you know, if you have, you know, if, if you have a weak midsection, you probably have small lats. If you have like an, a weak serratus, you'll probably have small lats. If you have like a, an unstable pelvis, you'll probably have small quads, right? So breaking apart muscles and movements, you need to realize that like a lot of times it comes down to the medium, right? Like if you're gonna use a barbell, train it to build strength and make that be your primary movement. If you're gonna use a dumbbell, probably make that accessory. Like that's not necessarily going to be like you were pressing, what, 175 dumbbells. Like that's insane, but more insane was that was the 405 barbell incline press you did prior to that because that's going to be the heaviest potential to loading the nervous system then all of a sudden we go from you know i went from challenging uh, movement to challenging muscles right and that's going to be the difference between training compounds and training isolation it's like is the goal to move the bar a to b then you want to involve as many muscles as possible is the, is the bar is the goal of the movement to train the the pecs because that's going to be totally that's going to be a totally different adaptation Right? And the way we set up for the exercise, like if you're trying to challenge your pecs and I'm trying to challenge mine, we might have totally different angles on the incline. We might be using different implements. I might be better off with like a, a cable because I need to create a lot of internal rotation to align my humerus with my sternum angle um, where you might want to use a decline press or a flat press. So I think there's certain rules to training movements that we need to consider. Like, look, gravity is a constant i don't care like where you're from what color you are that gravity is going to pull to the center of the earth so making sure that we align ourselves in the most efficient way possible to train movements and purposely create inefficiencies to train muscles because we want to make things if you're trying to train a muscle and origin to insertion try and make it as hard as possible so you have to use as little amount of weight as possible because as you start to scale that strength in isolation you're really going to start to be able to scale your progress there we go um for anybody that's beginning, recommendation, let's say, hypothetically, you got the, let's go with the 18-year-old kid. He's going to go in the gym for the first time. Um, he wants to be a, a bodybuilder, so he wants to have that shape. Does he have to train heavy? Um, does he have to do the compound movements? What is your take? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Honestly, like, I mean, we train at Gold's. And Dexter Jackson also trains at Golds. 
Like to be a bodybuilder necessarily, do you need to squat bench and deadlift? When's the last time you you've worked there for a while? When's the last time Dex squatted? Um, no idea. I've never seen it. Dex squat. It's been decades since I've seen him squat. Right. So for but then to draw a comparison, he's what six years younger than Ronnie. Yeah. Right. And he's probably eight less back surgeries than Ronnie. Like you know. Ronnie's a legend for the things that he's done and you know I don't think anyone will ever have that sort of lore around them like but you know he was also taking an 800 pound double in a single ply suit you know and wanted well, more yeah and like wish 12, he did more 12 days out from the Olympia yeah so it's like you can be an incredible bodybuilder without this I think to in order to be able to squat and squat heavy long term it is going to be an expression of good function like, if something goes wrong, it's going to go wrong in a squat. Like, if your knees are going to hurt, they're going to hurt on a squat before a leg extension. They're going to hurt on a squat before a hamstring curl. So if you're using these movements, this can be a light on the dashboard for you as a bodybuilder that you need to maybe assess your function of your hips, pelvis, shoulder, spine, whatever. But if you want to skate and just challenge muscles, you can absolutely do that. But you're putting yourself in a very, very small box. Because what then if what all of a sudden what could have been, you know, my knee kind of hurts on a squat is where are you going to go when your knee hurts on a quad extension? How are you going to train your quads? Right? It's going to hurt on a hack squat. It's going to hurt on a leg press. It's going to hurt on a walking lunge. Done. You're done. You have, you're backed yourself into a corner. So I think it's an incredible tool for bodybuilders to use because it gives you real time information of what's coming down the track. Like knee pain is going to start on a squat. And then you pull the squat away. It's like, okay, well, maybe fix whatever's wrong with your hips or ankles that's causing that knee pain rather than just going, oh, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. Now, I didn't set you up to go in this direction, but I'm going to keep going this way because of the fact that you were you came in and started being a strength coach up at Stanford for the rugby team. Is that correct? Right. So you're working with athletes first, um, in a sense, for, for, for that portion. And one of my beliefs is that um, I was an athlete first, and I power lifted and I bodybuilt and I did martial arts. But I was always an athlete in my mind first, and that was the most important thing to me. Um, and so when it came to powerlifting, it was the proper form, the explosion. Uh, when it came to the bodybuilding, it was, okay, now let's stimulate the muscle. But during both of them, what's my range of motion? Um, how can I put myself in the strongest position, move the most weight, and then how can I put myself in an awkward position and still move a good amount of weight uh, in a weak position? So that way I can continue to do this for a long period of time. And again, go back to the point of knees feel good, hips feel great, lower back's good, all this is fine, I can keep doing this. For you, what is it that if the kid walks into the gym 18, they're both 150 pounds, they gotta put on size, again, uh, both just start stimulating the muscle or is there something that we can kind of teach them outside of form? outside of just building muscle about uh, connective tissue or bone density or nervous system and those kind of things to where we can enhance them athletically yeah i think a lot of people don't realize that like so stress is what we'll call an aggregate so like your body has a physiological response to stress and stress is training but stress is your cell phone bill stress is your mortgage stress is the guy who cuts you off in traffic right we only know one physiological response to stress and if exercise is meant to be a quantifiable stress that we progress over time knowing how to cope with stress physiologically psychologically that would be where i would start with an 18 year old because that's where most 18 year olds don't look they don't realize that their sat score i don't know what the sat score is 18 i don't know is that is that too old 16? Is that what yeah back well, when i like, took it in 1932 <laughs> see what happened right but like that would be the biggest thing that i think needs to change in the shifted mindset because like i could sit here and be like well you know we could do plyometrics we could do isometrics we could do all this other training related stuff that you could probably find somewhere else on the internet but understanding like look i, I was a strength and conditioning coach at one of the most prestigious universities in the world the i had two students that would come in to me two players that would come into our session that the professor they had before was condoleezza rice <laughs> but, like, yeah, if you're in with politics that's yeah, a pretty big name even if you're not into politics you know the name yeah and it's like 
I, I here I'm sitting there, 25 year old meathead in a weight room. It's like I got to be able to bring it, but I also need to understand like that. I couldn't imagine being 18 in a position where look, these people are not going to pay their bills playing rugby, right? They're going to be the CEOs of Forbes 500 country, or they're going to be Secretary of State, or they're going to be President, or whatever. So it's like understanding the stress. It's like look, some days where it's like you just came off a road trip. It's middle of the season. You're, you're in a business undergrad and Condoleezza Rice was your last professor and you have a paper to write tomorrow. That, that, that's, that's, that hang clean that we were going to do with a barbell is now box jumps, right? The being able to drive the same intention of the exercise, like here's explosive power, but here's minimal skill and less stress because you're already peaking in your stress, right? So that would be the biggest thing that I would, like a frame shift in mindset around training to indoctrinate into kids that age that will see you further along in your career than going oh yeah no like do squat bench deadlift and then do then do your your accessory movement i love that you took you took something that it's again the majority of society is the gym is about muscles and getting stronger and making this body where you go well okay but it could also be used to enhance your entire package the mind and, and that's a huge thing. And I hope you guys and everybody at home gets that because of the, the, the concept that you just gave is going to enhance them more than any workout, in a sense, body-wise, um, than anything. Yeah, just well, that mind change. It's about what you can recover from, right? And like with stress being an aggregate, it's like if they're so far down, like the stress response adaptation curve, like they're so just... You know, they're right in the middle of midterms and, you know, Condoleezza Rice called them out in class and, you know, they got to pay their crazy expensive tuition and we're playing Cal next week and we're going to get the, the break speed off us by these bunch of Polynesian kids. It's like, there's no point, right? There's no, there's no point in introdu- introducing a stimulus they can't recover from. And, and that's not to say don't train hard. No. Right? It's just to understand that, look, if you're really focused on your goal, like this hashtag no days off crew or whatever, it's like if you were really focused on the outcome, like if the outcome is to, you know, train every day, then train every day. Sure. But if the outcome is to kind of in, I look at training as like and, and coaching people for whatever their goals are. It's like, look, yours, the sport is life and you're a strength and conditioning coach for life where it's like for a rugby team, we have a very desired outcome. It's like you want to decrease likelihood of injury, improve performance on the field, and hopefully that transfers over to the skill and you can win games and win a championship, right? But for most people who don't have that, it's like, how can we start to implement strategies to use training as an adjunct to your life, which a lot of people might miss the boat on. It's like, look, if you need to scratch that itch and train every day, rock on. But if you think that that is going to transfer over across the aisle to improving your physique to the best that you can, you're dead wrong. Yeah, well put. Well put. I hope you guys understand that. Um, in in let me back it down just a little bit for layman's terms in the sense of uh, you go into the gym, you're stressed out, um, but you, on your program it says that you have to do your squats followed by your deadlifts, um, and you are beat down emotionally. But by you just going to the gym and just getting the workout in and changing it, maybe not such to the extreme of a squat and a deadlift, but something that you're in there and you're still doing that battle that a mat, uh, uh, emotional battle of, of being that beast that you want to be um, instead of going home and calling it quits that is somewhat in a metaphor of what we're talking about is that uh, be okay changing it be okay uh, knowing that uh, the step forward in the gym is going to help you mentally yeah, and I think if you, so much. If you understand the principles of those two, like let's go with those two exercises. It's like, what do we have? We have a squatting pattern and a hinge. It's like, all right, maybe you want to keep the weight off. You had a long day. I mean, we drove nine hours, took the PCH. It's like, you know, what would, was going to be a back squat is now a hack squat. I still, you know, you was, you know, like blind by the end of it. Like I was seeing stars at the end of it. Like that's what I'm after. But that would have, on a barbell, I would have crippled myself. But it's like, all right, I need to go in a place where, like, I was sitting for nine hours on this drive, maybe having, you know, an unstable spine under load, probably not the best. I'm going to go to that hack squat in the corner, and I'm going to put plates on it until I can't walk. How can, you, how can you calm down the beast in the corner? Because in this stage, you're the coach. Um, but how can they coach themselves? Because they're just such animals, and they want to go in and they train every day, and, and they're getting ready for this uh, powerlifting meet. We got eight more weeks, and again, they got to put the weight on their back today. Um, how can you talk to them and say, 
let's, uh, like they say, fight another day. Um, let's go in and do something, but let's not kill ourselves. Because this is where the injuries come. Because I don't think people realize that your body's in a weaker state when you're stressed out, when you were beat down emotionally at work or, or with the family or the bills we go back to. Um, you're, you're in a weaker state mentally, physically, and then you go into the gym and you still try to push those same numbers that you pushed when everything was great. How can they calm down? How do they, how do they question themselves? What do they need to ask themselves the importance at this point? Well, that's like, I think it's always being goal oriented, right? Like if the goal is to put up a big total on the platform, what would like risk benefit ratio of going in and tearing a muscle by trying to, you know, fully send it on that day where you don't feel up for it. Like if you can, when I see people make decisions, hastily decisions that are counterintuitive, but in the short term, like they satisfy this like, oh, you know, I'm so frustrated with everything. It's like, yeah, but dude, you haven't slept in three days, right? Like you can crank the Red Bull and turn on the five finger death punch or whatever your angsty music is and you can go for it. But is that the same, is that, is that the, is that the behavior of a person who really wants to put up a big total in eight weeks? Or is that the behavior of an angsty child who wants to prove how mad he is at the situation that he's in? And it's like, if you can get really clear and honest with yourself, then you'll make better decisions. Like, cause look, I've torn a pec and a quad clean off the bone. And by turning on smashing pumpkins and saying, I don't want to be a guy who puts up a big total in eight weeks, six weeks, two weeks. Hold on, I, what's going on here? You like fancy restaurants and yeah. smashing pumpkins. Right. Mo, those are like your two favorites too. Okay, so you and me are gonna hang. We're gonna go to the nice little restaurant <laughs> and enjoy, and then you guys can go hang out and listen to music no, and stuff. <laughs> I'll bring the core again. Yeah. So uh, you, you've you've lived it. You've done it. Um, I could see why you were the coach and, and why you got that position. Mostly at a school like Stanford. If you guys don't know, Stanford is an extremely uh, top notch school. Um, but the way you speak about this, and, and again, it, it starts and it stems from uh, your mindset, um, picking and choosing what's the most important thing. Continue forward, continue forward. It's, it's always about going to the gym. Um, maybe you agree or don't agree. Do the least amount of work possible, but still get better. Um, not to go in and destroy yourself. Um, and it's a tough thing, because I remember being 20. I remember if I can, I, if I can train longer than everybody, if I can lift more than everybody, then obviously I'm better than everybody. That's not the case. That's the case for that day. But you can't keep that, you know, that continuous mindset up. Um, so the way you, you put things and break things down, I love it. I but love how you're doing it. There's a flip side to it, right? Because, like, cause like you've, you've done that. You were 20 years old, and you've stayed in there longer than anyone else, and you did more reps, you did more sets, you did more weight. And you walked out, and you're like, yeah, fuck yeah, that was awesome. But, like... You in the continuum of your training, you realize now like that that's not that's not the play. But it's only because you've gone there, and so this works two ways. Because I've gone there and I've torn stuff off the bone and almost cut my head off with two hundred kilo bench press and six sixty one squat on third rep tore my quad. Like because I've gone there, when I say hey scale it back, I'm gonna get more buy in. But at the same time, when I say turn it up, and I like you have a good program set in place, I'm working with an athlete. And it's, you know, we're in the middle of the off season right now. Like NFL, NFL camps are going to be start spring training in April. Like I got a few guys now that like, look, when I say go, go, right. There's no timidity. Like, yep, yep. but when I say pull back, you pull, pull back, back, right. Cause I've been there what I should have and I didn't and I pay the consequence. But the, a lot of people who are, don't have that experience, they just focus on when like, oh no, 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 we don't want to overtrain. We don't want to overtrain. It's like, yeah, no, that's something for sure. But then because I have overtrained to the point of injury, I say, I can be timid and say, no, don't, not now. But when I put on the other hat and say, listen, dude, now's the time, you better march. And don't give me any, I, I, I call that my leash off. I do the same exact thing. And we didn't plan this conversation, guys. This is just, we're just free balling uh, and free balling. Um, <laughs> and again, off Facebook. Um, I will tell them, this is the stage where we pull back, this is the stage where we relax. I'm going to ask for the leash off. And when I say leash off, I need your 100% and I don't wanna hear nothing. I don't wanna hear you gripe, I don't want you to say, hey, I'm tired today, I don't want none of that. During this portion of time, we got eight weeks, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I love it, it's, it's the same kind of concept. There's gonna be a lot of times where we say kind of pull back um, and it's a give and take. Obviously, if we were working with the individual itself, we'll be able to say leash off 
okay, this one day we can't go to leash off, but the majority of it is. Right. Um, and, and you've been injured in a, in a, in a stage um, completely uh, the chest and the quad uh, with those kind of numbers and stuff. That's, it, this is a great transition right here. How, from those injuries, did you continue forward instead of saying, well, this ain't for me? Uh, I mean, for me, it's, it's not even an, it's not even an it option, right? Like, I was doing, I, I tore my pack preparing for the Arnold uh, two, three years ago, three years ago, two years ago. Tore my quad preparing for a meet after that. And it's like, it's not even, it wasn't even a conscious thought. It was the the first thing. I got hit by a car five years ago on my bicycle. The 91 Chevy. Uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. I yeah, 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 yeah. I, I thought I recognized yeah. the Escalado front. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, oh, there he is. Rules right. of the road. Right. Stay to the side. Well, and but it's like, I remember going home as I tore my labrum and tore my bicep tendon and tore my rotator cuff, separated my AC joint. And like, I was like, okay, I just, I can still do bicep curls. <laughs> so I do bicep curls. But and if there's, there's something to that. Like, I think there's an intangible to it. Right. right? And that's, that's something that when you talk about like athletes and you get to work, we're lucky in the sense we get to work with professional athletes. Like that's the X factor, right? Like, you know, the epigenetic expression of look, you know, you're there's the, there's a bullet in the chamber, but the training will pull the trigger. It's, and that I think is the biggest thing is like the, that mindset behind, like I said the other day, like the, the dog's got to hunt, right? Like some people, that's the fork in the road. Like some people have it, some people don't. And that's like, that's up to you to figure out basically whether or not how much you love to train. And that's really it. Like, it's nothing more. It's not a beating of the chest masculine. Like, how tough are you? Like, how bad do you want it? It's like, how much do you love it? Like, how much? Because for me, it's like, that's all I've done for 15 years of my life is lift weights. That's every day. What are we training? Or when, when do I get to train next? So that, that's, a, that's a tough question to answer for people because it's a question they can only answer for themselves. Yeah. Uh, question then for you. Because um, I think passion and motivation is you, you found what you love. And, and, and that's no question. Obviously, when you get injured like that, it was not a question of, uh, I, I want to choose something else. This maybe isn't the right thing for me. You were like, no, no, no. Get better. Go, keep going. Keep going. And that's, that's true passion in, in my eyes. Uh, for these kids that are out there and they want to do this kind of lifestyle, um, but they're focused on it being uh, the visual or the number, um, I'm going to be famous because I'm going to lift a lot. I'm going to make a lot of money because I'm going to look good. What can you say to those kind of kids that, that, that it's the, the one route to the fame and fortune relative to, because I'd like to know what goes on in your mind when you're lifting? What is it that, that gets you from you're traveling down from the Northern Cal nine hour drive to coming in to train with me and waking up at three o'clock in the morning to do so? What is it that goes through your mind and, and how you feel during the workout and then you leaving? Yeah, I mean, that's a t So I'm probably, I think like we're, we're the same age, so we're probably like um, the last you're, generation. You're much more mature than him, though. I don't know. He's got the glasses on. Uh, I think he likes pretty good. <laughs> There's no lenses in there, are there? all of us <laughs> um, No, I think, well, what's weird, man, like I'm, the la I'm probably the last generation of lifter to come through and start lifting without social media. Like, I started training when I was 15. I was like, maybe MySpace was a thing. Maybe, like, I don't think I have. My sister was it's like. It's still a thing. Is it still I a got thing? a MySpace. Yeah, you, it's you and Tom left. Yeah, <laughs> yeah me and Tom. and Tom. He's my friend. He's <laughs> my top my, five. Sitting on MySpace. But no, like, for me, it was like, you just did it because there was no ancillary benefit. And you've seen the full evolution of this from, like, you know, like, into magazines and the popularity of lifting over, you know, into popular culture over the last 20, 30 years, right? Like. That's why I can't relate in a sense because I'm too removed from this culture, the 20-year-olds, the because right. I grew up in a time where uh, it was magazines. And, and uh, uh, so lifting for me was because I, uh, of my learning disability, my reading and writing was so abused uh, in a sense that I needed something. And that was the battle I had, the lifting. Um, so it wasn't for fame and you know, money. It just happened to come because I loved it so much, and it gave me such an outlet. And so I try to tell kids today: if if you're doing this for fame, or you're doing this because uh, uh, the money's going to come and all that kind of stuff, you're not going to be able to maintain because it's hard to maintain. Right. You're not going to maintain this because it's going to get hard, and there's going to be bad days. And if you're chasing money and fame, 
as a dead end. Yeah. Uh, that comes only, that only comes if, if, if you're good at it or if, if that true passion or people connect to you. I think it's, you have to assign meaning to it. Like, and, and the money is whatever, transient, the lifestyle, it could all be gone tomorrow. Like, and, but that's the thing. Like, if, if Instagram went dark tomorrow, we'd be in the same place. We'd be there at 4 a.m. I'd probably roll it at 5, 4.30 and like let you guys do your half hour warm up first. But like, right. Listen but, to this, <laughs> listen to this. Cause this is, this is more important than anything. Yeah. Cause I think like that's where, like if you can assign a meaning to it, like, and look, in the early stages when I started training, I remember getting muscular development and like the, the silver color one with Cutler after he won the Ford yep. Olympia. Like everyone, I know that one. Yeah, everyone knows. Like, I was like, yeah, that was like my motivation to go to the gym. But now it's like, I don't know. I think my mom bought a magazine, a muscle and fitness I was in last year. And that was probably the last fitness or the first fitness magazine I've owned in, I don't know, 10 years. So it's like the books now that keep me going aren't magazines. It's like I'll read on philosophy or history or things like that. And it's like if that is, I think people need, and we talk about this a lot, like people need like a struggle, right? We live comfortable lives. Like my Airbnb in Australia didn't have air conditioning. I was like, this is bullshit. It's 40 degrees. Everyone's like, what am I doing? Like, all right, we're just going to go check into a hotel. Like, but in, you know, it's not by, it's not like it's a bad thing that we live comfortable lives, but it's like, you need to seek out some level of discomfort to make change. And that's not like a metaphysical thing. That's literally physiological gene expression. Like, you are not what you be, can become until you put your body under stress, right? And for the longest time before Airbnb and air conditioning, like stress was physical. That was the only stress. That's where your physiological response is the same, right? So when I was sitting there going like, oh, Airbnb better give me a refund. This is bullshit. But it was like, all right, is this really a problem? It's like, no, it's not a problem. So like I can, I've created situations like literally when that 441 pound bar was like coming from my throat, it's like, I, oh, I could die. I didn't care about Airbnb refund at that point. So I think if you can assign a, like or find a meaning, maybe assign is the wrong way to put it, but find a meaning in training, everyone I kind of surround myself with now who does this for a living, those are all the people that when the cameras go dark and the YouTube algorithm changes, we're still gonna do the same thing. Cause there's a meaning in it past, this is all cool, like I'm looking around and hey, look, that's you. I'm like, oh, I have that in a magazine at home. But like, you'd still be doing the same thing if it wasn't for that, right? And it's, that's a hard thing to articulate because like we don't know what it's like to, to be indoctrinated into lifting in that way. Like we had to go find it. I remember elite FTS blogs when they first came out. Like I remember Teen Nation. Like who is this crazy French Canadian guy that I have to keep like listening to his voice when like they could embed YouTube videos for the first time. And YouTube was more than just cats playing piano <laughs> and shit. So it's like there was like you had to really go looking for good information. Now it's like. I almost am empathetic and I'm almost sad for people who come up now because it's like, you'll never have that. You'll never have like that niche cultural experience of being the meathead because everyone's, everyone's in on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough. Like, and, and I don't want to sit there and demonize people because like, look, they're into lifting. That's sweet. But like, how into lifting are you? Right. Right. It's, it's almost easier for us to be more passionate about it because that was exclusion criteria that was set forth us from the beginning because it was harder to access. Uh, you're kind about that because it is true. Uh, I started lifting at four in the morning at nine years old because it was the paper route. Get back to the house. Uh, I would do the workout and then I'd go to school. And it's something I just stayed with for 42 years. And I'll, I'll train at four in the morning and it's not because... Um, but now it's it's definitely became that because I was doing TV shows like Gladiators and stuff, and you're not going to get time to train, um, and 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 I just live a crazy workday life, to where I start work at 6:30 and I go until 8 o'clock, so the only time I can train is 4 to 6, and it's also my time to meditate. Like Ben was getting up and and in the middle of the hotel room meditating. That's my meditation. I love it. And so to think about growing up now in today's day and age where social media can make you money, can make you a huge celebrity, and to get sucked into training or having that good ab 24-7, um, it is pretty, I don't know how to say this, but it, you get sucked into it. Now, now you're like, oh, I can make a living because I'm a good-looking girl. And if I keep putting up body shots, I'll keep building this thing. And now I got 3 million followers. I keep putting up body shots. Um, yeah, if it goes dark, really, truly, what will you continue to do? Because um, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a soul search 
for the guys with the good abs. And now, it, what, was I doing it for for me, or was I doing it because of becoming famous, or the girl that keeps putting the one shot out there every day? And, and that's and, the for me. That's it's impact versus influence. Like you can, regardless of whether or not you utilize social media to monetize, if you provide people value and you have impact over influence, you will continue to make money regardless of social media. Like, and I think that's the biggest thing. Like, how much value can you provide someone? Like you have all these lights and cameras and he's sitting here pretending to do something on the computer and it's like, right, but it's right. <laughs> but there's, there's a value to be had here. Like you're not it's like, you know, this is, this is going to go out on the internet and people can do with it what they want where it's like, yeah, you got to have, I think now it's the, the stakes are raised higher because you kind of have to have both. Like I'm not going to be the strongest guy in the world. I know that. But when I compete on a powerlifting comp, like a comp, at a competition on a platform, I'm not competing against the other guys. I'm competing against all the other educators out there. So it's like when I, you know, I've been uh, at meets when the U.S. Open two years ago, I competed against Larry Williams. Now, like, Larry Wheels is, like, the biggest deal in the world as far as powerlifting goes. But I wasn't competing against Larry. How the fuck could I compete against Larry Williams? The guy benches, like, 700 pounds. Like, I can't do that. But I'm competing against, like, other educators who might get contracts that I'm bidding for with major corporate gyms across the world. It's like, okay, I need to be stronger than that guy. Right? because and I need to prove that I can continuously provide value and the way you do that is not by bringing yourself up it's like yeah you can take your shirt off and do that but it's doing stuff like this and trying to raise the bar for everyone else like I think that's where because like, I'll get questions now like oh like I want to travel and do what you do it's like that's great but what have you done for anyone else right a lot of people just get too focused on themselves when they start to enter into this business and it's like yeah I mean you're chatting with a ton of people right now and it's like for what to help them right this you know you could be sitting there petting the four dogs in the other room that's what i'd be doing <laughs> but it's like you're but you're providing value and i think that's when when we all come down to why this has turned into a career that's that's the the default answer it's like you want to help people and if it's like you're just the only person you want to help is yourself then yeah you can ride the algorithm and do your paid spend on your ads and make your money but that's easy come easy go if you go the route of providing value you'll always have a job I think, uh, so if, if you guys are watching this, the, the one reason why I know what he's doing and, and how he's, he's giving a, a knowledge is because I'm going to probably argue with anybody that you understand the, the, to put a program together, a nutrition plan or a training plan, I'm confident that you could do an incredible plan. I'm, I'm confident that you could take somebody that was just starting uh, into powerlifting and you could take them all the way to the nationals. But the one thing that you went to uh, when you're talking about training and, and compound movements or secondary or anything is that you went to the mindset. And that to me just says that you are out there and you are, you are actually really helping people and stuff because it's the mindset. Get that in control. The rest is kind of, you know, we'll study and we'll learn and we'll grow together. But you get the one thing done. Uh, so that's a beautiful thing. I think that that shows kind of like who you are in your soul. So I can appreciate that. Well, what was the text message you sent me? I'm going to literally read this right now and read what did you send me? Like, I, saw I, I know you have a history of training early in the morning. So I was like, hey, Mike, Jordan, Shallow, blah, blah, blah. Wednesday morning. I said 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you name a time. 4 Skip the part where I say send nudes. <laughs> so I skip uh, that part. 4 a.m., love that you already know. No time for sleep. We have a world to take over. I was like, who sends that? Like, we're lifting weights at an ungodly time in the morning. Who sends that other than an unwell person? That is, that is a, But that's the exact kind of, like, mindset that all of my friends who do what we do have, right? Like, that's going to be it. Because someone would look at that and be like, this guy's fucked. I'll see you at 10. And I'll be like, all right. Alarm set for 3.30. And I slept for 45 minutes because I was too excited. And I think you, that's something, that's an intangible piece that's hard to teach. It's hard to teach. Right. Um, well, I, I got these guys over here. Tons of, wow, what did you do to this computer, man? What have I done? This guy's like doing stuff over here. <laughs> How are you on this? And then over there, you guys don't know this guy. What's up, IG? Are we on my uh, fans only premium account on Snapchat or something? Okay, start the car. <laughs> start the car. We're out of here. Um, you got questions for us? This, quiet. They're quiet, huh? Yeah, and I'm, I'm pushing them, too. Okay, so, guys, again, he's here doing all this. You guys uh, definitely feel like you're asking questions. I'm going to go into uh, something um, I'd like to talk about is that I understand that steak is, is really bad for you and carbohydrates should be eliminated 
for consumption. Um, what's the truth on this? See, that's the thing. Like, I don't understand. I, okay, here's the truth. The truth is it's not about nutrition. Oh, go. It's not. Go. It's about identity. That's all it is. Like, people aren't Democratic or Republican because of the oh, way they think. Oh, man. They're, they're, no, but it's true. Like, these are diet identities. Oh, my Like, just... I'm carnivore, I'm keto. It's like, great. So you can go to Austin, Texas and eat with your paleo friends at that one conference. Or, like, there, I literally saw someone, there, there's a, there was paleo awards this year. I've never even heard somebody put that as an analogy in a sense. And, and sitting here, you're right. And I just watched a Joe Rogan um, stand up talking about vegans, and again, I, I love all of you, so don't don't worry about that. But Joe Rogan was really funny, man. You got to go see it. But he was talking about how uh, he was. It was so funny because he's sitting there talking to somebody for two minutes, and he's like, "Well, I'm a vegan." Oh, um, oh, okay. Uh, I just met you. Yeah. But it, it really is starting to come to an identity. Have you ever talked to someone from Harvard? I'm sure you have. Yeah, you know how you know because in the first minute they're they tell gonna you tell you, Harvard. right? It's the same thing. But like, is there? There's an elite. There's a there's a group think because now all of a sudden all your all of your decisions are made for you on behalf of the group identity. Because it's hard to be an individual. It's hard to have like discern your thought processes on different topics, especially nutrition. So people just go, I'm going to buy into this camp. I'm going to be indoctrinated by. You know, carnivore was really big, and then keto and paleo. It's like I don't even know if I know the difference. Like I just, like, and that's this is the same thing I do with training. Like my background is not, you know, in nutrition. I can, you know, I have a biochemistry background, and I can understand a little bit about it. But like, at the end of the day, it's like if you don't understand the base level principles, just like training, you're just sort of doing this plug and play. Like I will use the comparison of like if anyone out there knows how to build a website, like code a website like go in with like python or ruby red or you know c++ or html like write the base level code that is a soft that is a that is a website designer that is an engineer right that should be the goal in writing a program or writing a diet to be an engineer to understand how to write the code right where it's like i go on squarespace to like design my website and i drag a photo from like one thing and it's like oh like yeah, i'm a designer I'm a designer right but it's like no you're not you're not an engineer you're you're a, you're a monkey with two symbols like that's what you are and in the same comparison like you are not an engineer unless you know the base level code and like to use a music example like there's a lot of noise around dieting right there's a lot of noise around training but you have like if you wrote a diet that would be music because you're a conductor because you understand that look woodwind does this and brass does this and percussion does this and putting that together will sound like this hey guess what fats do this protein does this carbohydrates do this and you put this together you're going to get this sort of resonant harmonious out output that would be music where like these diets are just noise and then you realize digging deeper into the mindset of someone who would adopt i am a vegan like what does that mean i am not eating meat that is who you are. You are not eating meat. That doesn't make any sense. Or I am paleo or I am this. It's like you're telling me you are identified as who you are as a person on this earth by what you do or do not consume. And like that's that's absurd to me, but that's that's a red herring. It's not about the diet. It's about the psychological association with a group identity. That's all it is. To me, it's that's as clear as day. Like I remember the the kids who used to eat lunch under the stairs and listen to Lamb of God and put mascara on. It's the same thing. You might as well be vegans or carnivores. I was going through a phase. Yeah. But, but yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. Man, I still wear know, the mascara, sample, but still. Sample, I'm just saying. <laughs> you don't know. Don't knock until you try. But it's like that's that's all it is to me. Like there's base level principles. Like you can – it's not about believing in anything, right? And that's where when I teach, it's like what I teach is, is it's not a system. It's a system's way of thinking. It's like you can – you can believe it or not believe it all you want. Its existence is going to continue regardless of what you believe in, right? And it's the same with nutrition. It's just like here's here's protein, carbs, fats. Here's micro macronutrition. Here's net caloric. Here's intake. Here's deficit. Go, right? And that for me again, not classically trained as a nutritionist, but just in thinking laterally from what I see in training and trends and indoctrination and training and identities around training. Oh, I'm a hit guy, or I'm a German volume yeah. guy, or I'm yeah. a I'm a, I'm a Poliquin guy or I'm a Paul Check guy. It's like, you know, Poliquin, you're, you're training for 45 minutes. Paul Check, you're painting a picture between sets. It's like, what the hell is going on here, guys? Like, and we, it's, it's reps and sets and tempo and length-tension relationships. Like, these are the base-level principles. And it seems like 
not to say anything bad about Paul Sheck or Charles Poliquin, like they're both very influential, and especially in my world, but like when I see people adopt their principles, they're just dragging and dropping. Just like me on the website being a software engineer, just like me with two symbols making noise. Like there's no there's no engineering, there's no there's no conducting, there's no resonance, there's no thought process. And it shows. No, this is an incredible way to put it, and I love how you, uh, you put that. Um, I'm not going to add to it because, again, uh, my people know how I feel. Um, if you want to do a diet, do a diet. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, change it. Continue forward. Um, try different things. Uh, again, I go back to the fact that, uh, for me, carbohydrates is a great thing. Um, and it really teaches my body, uh, am, I, am I training too hard or not training hard enough um, for me and, and or dieting too long or not dieting long enough. But the way you put it to uh, break down that it's become an identity is it, it goes back to the days of when I first started lifting. Um, it was very much a uh, I'm a power lifter or a bodybuilder. And so when I started lifting and I competed in 1983 was the first show. Um, I, I was training with who, again, I, I, I thought were just strong guys. I didn't know they were the strongest in the world. Um, Doyle Kennedy, Doug Furness, uh, Jeff Magruder. And so these guys were like, no, 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 we got to focus on the strength. You're a power lifter. Remember that. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't, you don't look that good. Yeah. I like how those guys look. I want to be a body, but you can't do both. Uh, yeah. And it's that same sense for you guys out there, man. Um, don't identify. Don't jump the bandwagon. And, and again, you made a point that was great. It's hard to be the individual. It's always better to be part of a crew, part of a team. And I guess that's kind of one of those things where uh, if you're a vegan or you're a uh, carnivore diet, then you belong to something. And it makes you uh, relatable in a sense. But for me... I love it all. I love everything you stand for and what you're doing, man. Um, and you guys are in town for a couple more days, yeah? So we'll get some more puppy time in. Yes. <laughs> I was worried you were going to say 4 a.m. workout. So I'm like, ah, I'm busy that day. Puppy time. Sorry. Puppy yeah. time. If you got any questions, Jeffrey, watch a shiwa, ichiban. Nothing here. Nothing. You guys are very quiet today. A little quiet. A little quiet. I love it, man. Uh, thanks for hanging out today. Of course, man. Thanks for having me on. And, um, We've, we we just found out, I don't know when this is going to hit, but we just found out, I guess all of us found out yesterday, that the Arnold Expo is not going to happen. The show itself, um, competitors, I don't know if the amateurs are competing. I know the Strongman and the Pro Show is happening. Yeah. Is the amateurs still happening? I think so. RX put it up. I think Palumbo put it up yesterday. That amateur's still happening as well. I'm glad for them. Yeah. I'm glad that they're still being able to do that. With this whole... Uh, um, uh, virus thing. What's your What's your take on this right now? Oh, you Donald any? Trump came up with that. Hey, Donald did. The, the Donald, man. I'm imagining a golden <laughs> toilet on a golf course in Florida. He's looking at a Mexican beer because, of course, it would be a Mexican beer. And he just goes, I got it. Yeah, Mexican, no more of course. Trade, no more trade embargoes with China. No need for that talk. Trade embargo is taken care of. We're just going to introduce. I've never, like, the death rate is so low, the relative percent. It's very, like, it is seemingly insidious in the way that it transfers, but its mortality rates are quite low. Um, so I'm just going to throw in Alex Jones conspiracy theory that Trump made the whole thing. Trump made the whole thing. Because how job. beautiful a metaphor would the coronavirus be? A Mexican. I just imagine the red uh, tie down to the floor. He's taking a shit on a gold toilet on a golf course. He goes, problem solved. That's my, that's my two cents on it. Trump rocked it out. Knocked it out of the park. Nailed Good it. job, diplomacy. man. Diplomacy. <laughs> International <laughs> diplomacy at its finest. Sorry, guys. We're, we are taking it very seriously. <laughs> being video recorded that's it man we gonna make it we'll make it <laughs> what's next uh what's next we are um headed back up to san francisco for some more work uh this weekend then off to british columbia uh so canada teach a course and then over hopefully fingers crossed to the australian arnold's in melbourne um on the 17th we'll be presenting with eddie hall world's strongest man and then Oh, gee, I could do the whole year if you wanted to. We'll Jeez, spend a month no, in Australia. Great. Yeah. Eddie's great. I've never met he's, him. He, first time. I've, I've chatted with him a few times, and he's got a sixth sense of humor like me. So right. he's an awesome. Englishman, right? Yeah. Yeah, so you guys will have some fun. Looking forward and to then uh, you're originally from Australia, right? Yeah. And that's the one place I haven't been that I've always wanted to go. Um, it's uh, I've never met a person from Australia that wasn't, like, fun, outgoing, and down to earth. Yeah, they're great. 
Yeah. It's crazy. Crazy. I love that. Hi, Mo. Hey. <laughs> Dentist back. Uh, we were, let's jump back for one second. We were talking about, um, no, we won't talk about that. We'll save for another time. Carbohydrates in you. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. this is a whole nother episode. Yeah, this is a whole different world. I uh, have to be on camera and bring it. Easy. <laughs> Easy. Someone, stroke. someone got into the train, it looks like. <laughs> That's it, man. Thanks for hanging, guys. And again, man, anytime we do this, guys, this is your time to talk to somebody that's an expert at the biz. Ask those questions. There we go. Okay. Well, you want to take some pictures? Oh, yeah. I'd like to see if we can't get the pups. I know, I know, I know. We can try. Good luck. 